and the current section is called Academic Sport. The next presenter uh, will be Bjorn Fetter. Bjorn received his doctorate in philosophy in 2014 in Berlin, Germany. He is now working as an independent scholar based in Knoxville, United States. His main research areas include animal ethics, African philosophy, political philosophy, post-colonial philosophy, and phenomenology of normativity. He's going to talk about anti-superiorism on the ties between veganism and decolonization, decolon decolonization of thought. Sorry. Welcome, and you can start. Yeah, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, uh, I just want to give as, uh, as a preliminary remark that this is very much a, a work in progress. So um, there will be some, there, there might be some, some issues that I that I have not yet uh, thought through to the to a degree I would like to have them thought through. So um, I, I still think it is understandable by now, just as a heads up, that that there's that this is still a work in progress, not so much a presentation of of um, arguments with which I'm uh, totally happy. Um, I will give at first some comments on animal ethics, then I'll uh, turn to, to my understanding of decolonization. And in that section, I will also try to point out how I think these two things, these two um, systems of, of oppression uh, have something to do with each other. It seems rather indisputable and indisputable given that human beings are animals, but it seems it is implicitly thought concurrently that the human animal stands above all the other animals. Often the implicit assumption seems to be that human beings are hardly animals at all. The human animal is understood as a hardly animal. Anything that is not a hardly animal, all other animal creatures are mere animals. All non-hardly animal life is because it is non-human, just animal life. Non-human animals are thus relegated to being just animals as opposed to being a hardly animal. The hardly animal is distinguished from the just animal in a way that is of particular interest here to us. Um, it displays the unique hardly animal's capacity to suppress as it's realized in, for example, factory farming. And this is crucial. The difference made between hardly animal and just animal is obviously not a descriptive determination. This difference is first and foremost conceived as a normative difference. The evident empirical difference between a just animal and a hardly animal appears to, to, to us, the human animal, so grave that we have allowed ourselves from the simple facticity of our being different and in particularly of our power of disposition to deduce a most dangerous normative difference, or as I would like to polemically say, to invent this normative difference. The human being possess, posits that he or she is not just an animal like any other animal, he or she is not a just animal. The human being claims that it is to be understood in a very vulgar normative sense to be better than any other animal. And this creates the belief that the human animal is superior to all the other animals. If the Hartley animal is positioned as superior, then the just animal is con consequently considered inferior. And that means, again, in the most vulgar normative sense, the just animal is less good. The just animal's life is less important to the point that his or her life can be consumed. From the perceived inferiority of the just animal by the hardly animal, it seems to follow that the just animal's will to stay alive can be subordinated to the carnivore desires of the hardly animal. And thus, the will of life of the just animal can, which is on the level of the facticity, and may, and with this may, we find a strange transition into the normative level, be overcome by the will of the hardly animal. And there are a couple of things very strange here. I just want to point out two. The evidence of the diversity of human and non-human animals is perceived as an addition to the evidence of difference, the very fact that one is not like the other. Being distinct thus becomes imbued with worth and is about whether one, is one capable of taping life is more valuable than the other who can be consumed. However, when one is not like the other, then and this is still not fully understood, at least in Western thinking until very recently, then that is no reason to assume that the one is better or worse than the other. Normativity, uh, normativity is subsequently brought to the evidence of difference. Human thought is reflected in this addition and nothing else, coupled with an animal species imperialism. 
The normative difference is subsequently made from the difference between human and non-human. Subsequently, one of the compared entities becomes the better, superior entity, and inevitably the other one becomes the worse, the inferior. And this normative difference is divergent from the empirical difference. Empirical descriptions of human and non-human animals uh, simply, do not, uh, simply do not mean the same thing as making a normative comparison that concludes with uh, some creature uh, being better and worse. This only applies if we human beings put this normativity into the comparison beforehand. But as I wish to emphasize, there's nothing forcing us to do that. When comparing human and non-human animals empirically, we, we once again find no fact of value, but only the fact of difference. And this is a subjective value judgment, not an empirical one. Therefore, that the just animal was degraded to just animal is a distinctively human achievement. I, I would argue that it is in no way necessary. It does not come out of the so-called laws of nature. It is not inevitable. I want to say that this degradation is factual because we made it a fact, but it's not existential. It does not come out of, it does not necessarily come into reality because of the way we are. The second strange thing I want to point out is this. Suppose for a moment that there's in fact a normative difference between animals. So there would be hardly animals and just animals, just as a thought experiment. Even then, the second oddity remains a curiosity. It is in no way necessary that the hardly animals normative superiority, which we now expressly want to accept, should lead us to subjugate the inferior life in cruel dominance or decreeing a, 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 decreeing a hypertrophic absolutism about life or death or fabricating an entire just animal killing industry and so forth and so forth. And let us engage in even, even another thought experiment. Imagine an entire an, an entity capable of annihilating us to satisfy a mere lust of this entity, as, as I want to compare here to our mere lust for meat. We would scarcely doubt their power, but we would certainly doubt that this entity is better than us in a normative sense. Superiority does not necessarily dictate domination and have to lead us uh, to, as I would like to say, with the help of a term by Melanie Joy, to a carnistic absolutism of the hardly animals and consequent annihilation of the just animals. So the question begs to be asked, why did we not primarily use our superiority for a loving turn to, the, in this thought experiment, the inferior, instead of building up a killing industry? Why does the human enemy, a, a, animal which assumes it, find itself, it finds itself in a position of superiority, not help and care for the allegedly inferior animal. Of course, there are people who consume the non-human animal um, from mass production without any apparent concern. However, my impression, both from private and as well from, from uh, private as well as from uh, professional context, is that this is not the case for all people who consume mass-produced meat in so-called in so-called Western civilizations. It seems to me that the dilemma of attempting to justify industrial mass killings is quite widely perceived. And moreover, this problem is not just grasped, it is acknowledged and understood to be a problem. It is clear that, I annihil that I annih annihilation is problematic and unjustifiable, and it is relatively clear what the solution is, given the gravity of the problem. And yet, most people do not change their practice of superiority, which means their practice of meeting. This problem, of course, as pointed out by Melanie Joy and others, requires considerable effort not to keep this awareness current, to avoid it altogether or to not update it. As any animal ethicist may be aware of this strange phenomenon that there are large numbers of people who do not want or do not know how animals are kept in mass production facilities. And indeed, as I would like to guess, this is because it is already known. It is, but it is ignored in a strange process of denial. It is not only the avoidance of new knowledge, but, uh, but this is about the effort to forget what is so annoyingly hard to forget. Stop it, I have, and probably everyone here has already heard very often, stop talking about this, otherwise I cannot eat meat anymore. And what a strange request that is. Um, what does that sentence actually mean? I think it means that a person seeks to unmake, to unthink, and to annihilate an insight and the practical urgency that follows that insight. We find a person who has crossed a border which he or she has obviously recognized that they should not have crossed. 
wherever this insight may come from, but still wants to cross. We find somebody fighting his or her very own sense of what is right. And people who do this want to force themselves in a pseudo ignorance born of a conscious denial. And this is deliberately entertaining, uh, entering into self delusion. Human beings doing this do not want to understand, they do not want to acknowledge the urge which comes right of him or her uh, out of themselves. We find here human beings who have understood what to do, but do not want to be motivated to do, and they want to eradicate their insights, they want to ignore, they want to forget. And this is a, some, uh, a strange kind of self-mutilation of our very own thinking and our very own heart. The capacity for reason and for caring is demeaned here. This human being, if I may say so polemically, finds him or herself abusing his or her ethical impulse for the sake of a needless snack between breakfast and lunch. This is practical nihilism. This human being tries to annihilate his or her impulse to do the right thing, to care, to relinquish, to not want more, to control a desire. This human being tries to annihilate that it is not being alive that needs justification, but killing, especially in an industrial scale. But this aggression against one's own thinking and heart itself, this nihilism, demands even more. This aggression only works if there's some sort of silent social agreement uh, to suppress the relevant facts. The killing industry remains invisible, hiding its factories and imprinting its packaging with bucolic imagery. And this is where I think animal rights philosophy or animal studies meet with the decolonial thought. The intersection of these two the intersection of these two philosophies, I think, are part of one anti-oppressive, or as I'd like to call it, de-superiorizing social movement. Decolonization can be understood as a twofold undertaking. The first component is not so important. The second component will be more important, but I have to explain the, the first component at first, even though it's, it's a bit separated from uh, um, the point of the paper that will that to, to which I will come in a moment. The first component I would like to call atzeridation, which is derived from the Latin expression atzeridire, which means to come back to oneself. Colonized people have to atzeridate. The colonially violated human beings have to recover, have to reappropriate what is theirs. They have to regain their ontological leg legitimacy. And atzeridation can and has to be achieved only by those achieved only by those who suffered from colonial violence. The former colonizer is, even though he might be able to assist in some regards, of no essential importance here. The colonized, as we can see, for example, observed in Africa or South America, did not, uh, did come and can continue to come to themselves again without the colonizer. However, and this is widely ignored until today, for a decolonized world, for world post-colonialism, there's unfortunately more to do. And this work, then, on the other side, has little to do with uh, the efforts of the colonized people. This ontological re-legitimization of colonized people is done by themselves under their very own leadership. But the other component has to be done by someone else. In the Congolese Manifesto of Conscience Africaine, written in 1956, we find this beautifully documented. In that document, it says, many Europeans must modify their attitude toward the Congolese. We believe that that is possible. We ask the Europeans to abandon their attitude of contempt and racial segregation to avoid the continual annoyances of which we are the object. We ask them to also abandon their attitude of condescension, which wounds our self-respect. We do not like to be treated like children. Understand that we are different from you, and although assimilating the values of our civilization, we still wish to remain ourselves. So this manifesto asks, with a quite a astonishing generosity, the Europeans to modify their attitude. And this is precisely what has not happened. And this is precisely what I assume is the second part of decolonization that has to happen. This attitude of contempt has to be overcome, but it is not yet abandoned within the Western world. And this is, as I would argue, st structurally the same contempt as we have found in our thoughts about the just animal. Apparently, we find here that the Western hardly animal, the Western human being, makes quite an important further difference. They seem to be barely humans of more and of less value, of more and of less relevance. And again, this difference rests upon an undisputable factual difference. 
hair, skin color that subsequently has been interpreted as of normative value. In the Western world, the relevant barely animal has not learned to give up its conviction of its own superiority. However, I would argue this is exactly what has to happen. The West um, has to de-superiorize its thought. It has to overcome its understanding of being superior than other people. Desuperiorization and adsertion are needed to make an era post-colonialism post -colonialism possible. It's difficult to determine if there's a counterpart to adseridation between relevant and irrelevant barely humans. So if this is also parallel to the problem with regards to animal, but it is rather obvious that we find a similar form of degradation. The less relevant human being is degraded in the same way the non-human animal is degraded based on the empirical normatively irrelevant differences. Again, as in the subjugation of the non-human elements, a lack of knowledge is hardly the problem. The colonial violator must not primarily learn about his or her wrongdoing. Rather, they must work on establishing a new reality in which the colonial transgression is no longer possible. The practical action that a colonial violator must understand as a central task must be the work of desuperiorization of, uh, of thought. And according uh, action that, uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, must be the deep desuperiorization of thought and in an according action as part of the process of decolonization. Only once we can desuperiorize ourselves, we become a, can become a partner who can begin an actual serious discussion with this at Zeridated peoples. Colonial violence, colonial superiorism can only be fully overcome when the violator rejects his or her violence and it rejects his or her normative epistemologically violent stance. Colonialism cannot simply be declared as something inappropriate. It, that is not enough. It is not enough to state that it is a thing of the past. The colonial violence, the keeping the coloniality of being alive, like any form of superiorism, has to be truly unwanted. And this is not a matter of knowledge, but a matter of a highly personal um, decision and then a subsequent personal uh, taking of action. The silent social contract of contempt towards human beings of allegedly less value has to be unwanted. The fight against non-human animal suppression and against less, room human, uh, less relevant human beings is in the end a fight against the same enemy. It is a fight, as I would uh, argue, uh, against superiorism, against those who have the power to suppress and against those who can deform factual differences into normative differences for the sole purpose of their lust for more and more and more. It is the same greed that makes us want more and more cheaply harvested coffee and makes us want, want to eat more and more cheaply produced burgers. The superioristic uh, distinction has to be unwanted for overcoming of colonialism and speciesism to be a possibility. We have to not want to be these kind of colonial or species uh, murderers, and we have to continue to unwill this aggression until it becomes practically impossible for us. We need to understand that we have no right to ontologically delegitimize a non-human uh, animal or an allegedly less re relevant human animal. If one does not unwant the colonial or species privileges, the self-understanding of being entitled to receive those privileges is not dead, but just hibernating. If one continues to assume tacitly that one is better and one will, one will not be able to treat the other as equal, regardless of if it is a human being or a non-human being. Perpetrators of colonial violence and perpetrators of species violence must understand their superiority as a phantasm. They must stop willing to superioristically violate. They have to unwant so that this, uh, they have to unwant the aggression so that it becomes impossible. And this is indeed of uh, fundamental importance for the former colonial violator, him or herself. As Paulo Freire stated in, in his post-colonial works, no one can be authentically human while he prevents others from being so. And I would argue that we can add here that that should also be true for a non-human animal, non animal. So let me conclude. The structures of domination against the just animal are quite similar, if not structurally identical to those used against the victims of colonial violence, who are dehumanized and so often considered human, but of an inferior kind. They were also considered 
barely humans. We thus want to point out structurally just animals and barely humans are the same. Barely humans and just animals are suppressed because of completely unfounded self-enthronement of some human beings um, as, uh, the, the, who claim that they are uh, hardly humans on the one hand with regards to animals and superhumans with regards to the inferior, you see allegedly inferior humans. The misunderstanding of the human being as hardly animal and the misunderstanding of some human beings as superhumans made the invention of the inferior necessary, the invention of the superhuman and the hardly animal. Both oppressive approaches are designed to allow those who consider themselves superior to relentlessly exploit the allegedly inferior life forms. Both oppressive systems rest upon the delirious idea of one's own superhumanity. I would suggest we need to desuperiorize our thought not only towards the victims of colonial, but also to, uh, towards all living beings in general. We do not need these, we, we do not want these privileges. We, I'm sorry, we need not to want these privileges. We need to understand that we were never the rightful owners of these privileges because we were never and never will be better than any other living being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bjorn, for your presentation or for your reading. Uh, now, I, will I would like to move to the questions, if there are any. Let's see. Okay, uh, I'm looking on at Slido, but there is one question which is not related to your talk. So let me just check if there is anything in the chat. Only some praise. <laughs> this is nice. But I, I don't see any questions. So if anybody has, if nobody has any questions, then I think. That's all right. Nobody should feel urged. <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course not. I'm just again giving people some time. But if, okay. So, uh, there is one question actually in Slido. Let me just read it out for you. Uh, you. Is, is it okay to acknowledge the doubtless many advantages of the Western world, such as the degree of enlightenment, values, human rights, science, etc.? Yes. Um, so I certainly do not want to want to devalue um, the achievements that the Western world brought to reality. The problem is, that I think it's a twofold problem. On the one hand, we do not understand that the achievements of the Western world are the achievements of the Western world, and they are not achievements for all humanity. They can be shared by all humanity. They can be perceived by all humanity. But the problem that has happened is that they became some sort of standard objective truth which is very awkward because it was also Western society who, uh, Western philosophic society, uh, community who worked, uh, especially in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, on um, overcoming the dogma of objectivism. But still, um, it can be, for example, very well uh, observed in uh, current developmental politics. Current developmental politics usually um, argues from the standpoint of if of, of the of the understanding that if you want to become a so-called developed nation you in a way have to become a replica of the so-called western world and there is no reason why that should be and in in this moment it becomes very difficult because in this moment it becomes some sort of um understanding that if you do not become enlightened in the sense that europe has become enlightened you are led astray and I think that is a foundational misunderstanding on the one hand. So that's the one point. And the other point, which I think is, is much more important, important is that we do not adhere in the West to our enlightenment values. So if we invented, if we came up with concepts of self-determination, individual, individualism, uh, democracy, theories of the right and the good that have been especially um, to a incredibly sophisticated label uh, uh, degree have been developed within the enlightenment we would not do if we were serious about that we would not do a lot of these things 
And if you look closely, especially at the Enlightenment philosophers, from Voltaire to Hume to Kant, you will find, as I, I'm sure most of you know, blatant racism, blatant sexism, blatant ableism, um, absolutely homophobic in the worst form. When you read Kant's uh, um, uh, um, lectures on moral philosophy, it makes you shiver to read how homophobic this person was. So we have two, we have one of, of two different problems here. On the one hand, when the enlightened thinkers were talking about the human being, they were actually referring to the relevant human being, who is male, white, and heterosexual. Or they were not honest with their theories because they did not apply these theories to all human beings. It, is, it has been pointed out, especially by Nikita Dewan, that it's a very odd thing that when, while the European Enlightenment was sitting in the German and French and British salons, they were drinking coffee sweetened with sugar harvested by slaves. And everybody knew that. And nobody took offense on that. At least nobody in a way that something has actually changed. I know there are some documents, especially with Kant, it is often pointed out that in his later life he opposed colonialism, but then I always refer to reading his private notes that were not published, which are full of incredibly continu and, and a disgusting continuation of racism. So I think we should hold up Western values high. They are, these are very interesting concepts, and I think they are our culture. But there's two things. First of all, they are our culture, and there is no need to force everybody to eat the European Enlightenment up on the one hand. And on the other hand, if there's anyone who has to learn to take these values seriously, it is us. And we have to say, if this is made with slave, uh, uh, if, if this product involves slavery, we don't have it. We should not, on the one hand, send millions of dollars, for example, to Nigeria, and then destroy their local markets by sending uh, the, the rest of chickens that Europeans do not like to eat there. This does not go together. So that's my, my, my answer to that, which was probably a bit long because I don't get any annoyed feedback from, from people that I can usually tell when I'm in a room with them. So I'm sorry for, being a bit, for, for going too far there. I think no, there's some other questions now. Yeah, there are. I will read it out for you, but uh, the answer was not long. It was appropriate, don't worry. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and very interesting as well. Uh, has this work been submitted to any journals for publishing? Um, um, a, a little bit. The first part has been uh, uh, published in German. Uh, no, the, the part of the of the animals. A part of that has been published in for German, and on the decolonization, something has been published in English. So, if anybody is interested in that, please very, feel very free to 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 write to me. I'm I'm happy to send it to you. Um, what has not been published is this idea to put it together. So, I'm working on a. On a, on a bit bigger project in which I want to uh, address these, these problems of superiorism, um, of speciesism, col uh, colonialism and sexism, and try to point out that there's very, that, that, in the, that these ways to put people down, we always find these two structures. On the one hand, somebody superhumanizes him or herself, which then, which is, I, I think, usually motivated by just wanting more or being more in charge, having more power. And that goes together with, if I'm in charge, somebody else has to work for me. And I think most people know, as it is with the burgers, don't tell me about the, the slaughterhouse. I think most people do know that that is not all right. But then they make up and create myth. And I usually like to point out, if you look back into colonial literature, you find literally thousands of pages where people try to point out how good it is for a black person to be a slave because it is impossible for them to have a proper life. They can achieve nothing. So what the slave owner does is to help them at least achieve the, the tiny inferior value that they can give to the world. And I am of the firm belief that nobody ever believed that. This is I, I usually compare it to Nazi propaganda. This is the same way Nazi propaganda worked. The Nazis prepared the Holocaust and they knew people will not follow that. People will be offended by that. So they invented appropriate stories about the Jew, why the Jew deserved it. And I think with, with 
the, the problem with human beings is that we are able to accept stories we do not actually believe to make ourselves either okay with what we do or to give ourselves the comfort to just sit in our chair and do not get up and do not do things. So, and <laughs> to come back to the question, and this, this, this part has not been published. This, this idea of, the, yeah, this self-mutilation of the human mind and the human heart that we are in a very weird way are willing to do. And especially with, uh, in speciesism, it, it is so appalling because you are willing to, to, to brutalize your own heart and home think, own thinking for a, for a burger. I, it, it, it passes me how that's possible. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, another question reads, how is a European author epistemically entitled to lead a discussion on colonialism? Would this return Europeans to center stage which contradicts decolonialism? Yes, uh, so I, I'm very aware of that, pre, uh, that, that problem. I really try to avoid um, uh, um, a performance error. And I usually try to point out when I had a I had this brief excursion on at Zeridation on, on the necessity of people coming to themselves. And I only want to point out that that is a highly relevant part of decolonization, but that's not the part that I'm thinking about. And that's not the part that I'm entitled to think about. That is not my, or if I speak for a European or for a white scholar, that's not what I'm allowed, what I should think about. People need to think about that for themselves. The violated person has to come to to, to own conscious again on their own terms. But as I try to point out, decolonization from my point of view is a twofold problem. We can only achieve a post-colonial time if not only the person who got violated, but also the violator rethinks his, his self-understanding. And what we usually see, especially in developmental politics is that the Western world considers themselves as the donor, their donor conferences. What, what can we give you to finally overcome your poverty, to finally overcome famines and so on? Completely disregarding the fact that in Africa for about 140,000 years, people lived and all these problems were virtually unknown. They are known for two to 500 years, depending where you look. So it was us, we brought that there. And I think without a Western understanding that colonialism is not no longer a problem because it's long time ago, but it is still a problem because there has not been a moral revolution in the West. I think this is where the European scholar or the white scholar or the Western scholar, however you want to call it, comes to a very, he, he, he or she has a very important role to play here because we have to understand, and I'm speaking to whomever wants to be included in this we, uh, but I'm certainly including myself here. We have to understand that, for example, colonialism has been abandoned, not because we understood it's wrong, but because it was no longer possible because uprisings happened. It got very expensive. The world wars happened. Um, people, people, uh, it got more and more expensive. Um, a lot of plantations were harvested until there was nothing more to get. So what, end, what ended when colonialism in Africa was abandoned was not the understanding of a wrongdoing and the attempt to make it good again. We left because it wasn't worth anymore. It's like a thief who punches you to the ground, gets your wallet and then leaves. He does not leave because he understood, oh, that was wrong. He leaves because there's no, nothing else for you to get. And then that person being punched to the ground has to get back into his life. He, he has to learn, how do I go outside without being afraid? But that person will never be able to live peacefully unless I understand that punching someone to the ground is wrong and that I have to overcome this. And what, what happened after colonialism is it seamlessly slided into a neo-colonial, pseudo-post-colonial era of capitalist um, exploitation, which is usually then disguised as, yeah, but this is the free market, we, we can't change it. The, I think we can change it. And I think the, the, to, to conclude here, the, the important role of the European, of the white, of the Western scholar is to convince his, her, their peers. We need to understand 
that even though it's a long time ago, we have never in the broader sense, in a societal sense, have understood our crime, have understood why we were seduced to commit that crime. And we still do not understand that we have to give up pri privileges that were never ours. And I think this is a very important part in this. We are not able to communicate properly with African countries. I'm always referring to Africa because this is my main research area. We are not ready because we cannot be trusted. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, let me see and the other questions. I'd like to give you some some room to, to breathe. So another question reads, could you please suggest some further reading for us on this topic? Um, could you, could that person who asked that, uh, let me know what, what, what specific um, part of it? Uh, I'll answer it immediately. Can you, so is it more on the decolonial or more on the animal liberation? So then I think that would be easier for me to come up with something. So, so I, I will answer it as, as soon as the specific specifics come Yes, up. of course. I'm... You can either say so or you can write it in the chat if you are still here. Yes, please. Okay, I suppose the person is not here anymore. Well, if it comes later, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it as, as soon as it's there. But I can, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, there are more uh, questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, um, okay, another one is quite philosophical. So do objective truths exist? <laughs> wow. <laughs> It, it got uploaded, so... <laughs> yeah, I don't think that I'm entitled to answer that question, which it probably is, <laughs> is already my, an answer to it. I think objective truths exist because I think to a certain degree we need those. But at the same time, as philosophers, I think we're used to sort of step aside a little bit from ourselves. So I, I, try, to, I try to usually think of it like this, that there's something that can call, be called facticity and something that can be called existentiality. And as facticity, under facticity, I understand what I understand as an objective truth and cannot be disputed with me. But my facticity can be different from your facticity. So what I would say is we produce um, something like, you can imagine it like a circle of, 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 of um, factual truth that cannot be changed and that that will be uh, that will be decisive for the way that I live. And within that realm, you can sort of um, uh, develop your existential uh, smaller realm in which you make in which you make determinations determinations about things of which you think you can determine them. But I think there is no objective truth in the sense that it has to be objective for everyone and whoever disagrees with you would have to be forced to agree with you. What I think is very often a problem within scientific communities is that people tend to use arguments out of a certain understanding of, of, of maybe objective truth and they leave that realm of objective truth whenever it becomes uncomfortable. And I think, I think that in this case, you can force somebody back using a good argument. But in general, I would doubt if they are objective truth. I think we are, we need it, but at the same time, we have to be aware of the fact that somebody else might need something else or that you might find a human being who says, well, I don't need it. And probably that person is right or lying to, to him or herself or is, is not right. So I, I, I'd be very open there. None of this, what I said today is, set from the point of view of an objective truth it's from the it's from my point of view as i was educated as a more or less liberal european and i think within what we Europe, europeans think of ourselves we fail what we claim to be and that's so within that understanding of truth i would say we if there are standards and we claim to adhere to them well let's adhere to them or give them up and and be open to the world about the kind of people we are. Okay, thank you for such an elaborate answer. 
there are some more questions that just read them up for you. How we can include the animal suffering with the problematic of the decolonization? Um, so with the with the I, I talked about suffering, and I think suffering is very important within animal studies. But I'm always a little bit afraid to put it, to give it too much important beca importance, because I don't think that a living being has to suffer um, for me to, I don't think that, that, a, that a living being's suffering should be important for me with regards to me taking or not taking its life. And this is precisely what we do with um, with uh, with human beings all the time. So so I'm, I'm I'm having a little difficulty there. But if I can change your question into how can we how can we how can human liberation and um, non-human liberation be put together, um, or how can the projects of animal liberation and decolonization be be put together? I think there's a lot of stuff that I have not figured out yet and that I that I do not understand yet. But I think the the most important um, thing is that we have to come to our senses and actually follow what we consider to be true. And Vert, I have not met a single person in my life who said, I think mass animal husbandry is okay. So I have not found a single person in my life, and I asked a lot of people, and a lot of people have asked me about it, who is okay with this system. So I think, we have to find ways as philosophers or as researchers or also as private people to find a way that we start doing what we consider to be right. So I have never seen someone seeing, telling me that animal, mass animal husbandry is right, but at the same time, a lot of people do it. So I, I would like to see what would happen if that dust settles, if all people claiming that they do not want to be people like that would actually not be people like that. And I think this is precisely where it meets together with decolonization. If you do not want to, um, for example, produce the problems that we export into Africa, then don't have, for, for example, a cell phone contract that gives you a new cell phone once a year, because you know where that cell phone goes. There's a very high chance that it goes to the famous um, uh, dump in, in, in Ghana. So we have to change these things. And I don't know what to do if I would need, meet someone who says animal, that's okay, they should be killed. And I don't know, and I have met those people, I don't actually know what to, to say to a white supremacist if they, if they say to me, the white race is superior and everything else is just filth and needs to be eradicated. I don't know what to do, but I do know what to do with people who say, isn't there something, I mean, all the black people are in prison and all the white people are not, isn't there something? Then I know what to say and I can try to help them. Or if somebody says, yeah, I don't wanna be a jerk, but that guy is black, so I don't know, I can oppose that. And I can get all these people who, in a, to a certain degree, do not want to be specious and do not want to be racist. And I think, let's grab all these guys in the, in the middle. Let's grab all these people um, by their, private parts and make them finally become the people who they want to be. And then imagine that's, I don't know, let's, let's be crazy. Let's say that in the end, it's 50% of all the people you know, or 50% of the people in the world. Imagine the power we would have then. Imagine the, the things we could do. We could simply say, okay, there's no more animal husbandry in this country, in this state, in this area. So I think, this goes together. Let's become the people we want to be. Let's let's put these animals to freedom that we already claim to put that we want to put them to freedom. The same with all the human beings. Make yourself knowledgeable about um, whatever cycles of of where does my trash go and everything. Do that. Reach your other people and just make sure that all the people that are around you know that you are opposed to superhumanness and make known that nobody is superhuman. And I think if we do dehumanize, we liberate animals as well as, as humans, because this form of dehumanization goes together with taking, taking one's own uh, um, entitlement to rule over the end 
or the cow or the black person in, in the same way. So I think that that's where it meets. Okay, thank you. I think we have time. We have five more minutes, so there is still some time for a couple of questions or maybe one. Uh, what is your explanation why there is so much resistance from the human rights movement or leftist politics to consider animal oppression together with other forms? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a bit. The answer to that is quite sad. From my point of view, and that's terrible because these people are doing great, great work. I think that as much as we, as as especially in these times, especially when they're in the U.S., you experience an understanding of um, the problem of white supremacy towards other human beings. As little I think it is, it is there's very little widespread knowledge that it is a problem that speciesism should be included in that. I usually, when I read um, arguments of, um, of authors about human rights or about development politics, it's very awkward to understand that there's no understanding that these arguments should actually be true for, for non-human animals, true. You would have to apply them. There's no reason to not do that. And it reminds me when you read uh, literature from the 18th century or earlier centuries, um, very, very often these arguments by male philosophers should apply to females, but they do not see that they are in, in a massive performance error when on the one hand Kant claims every human being should, um, should come out of, uh, should come into intellectual independence by self-determination and at the same time claims that a woman cannot do that and that she is into, um, into smelling nice things and looking at nice things. So, and I think this foundational misunderstanding happens today, that if you, if you go to a human rights conference and then you see a snack bar full of the cheapest, disgustingly harvested meat, I think that is, that is a foundational, um, th that's a foundational performance error. And I think that the species problem is not seen because a lot of people are appalled to compare a human life to a chicken life. And they are, they are appalled by that because they think the chicken is inferior. But I would say, why would the human be superior? Yes, of course, it's my species. So it's in a way closer to me. I get it. I understand when a human being makes a little movement in his or her face. I, I probably understand the emotion and I probably do not understand or, or vital expressions of a chicken. But I do not know why that difference has normative importance. So I think that a lot of um, people working in human liberation are unfortunately hardcore speciesists. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is this person who asked the question about further reading. Uh -huh. uh, the person was specifically looking to read a bit more about the link between animal cruelty and decolonization. Um, so in the very specific way that I presented it today, I, I, that might sound a bit jerky, but that's probably, I would have probably referred to the both texts that I wrote because um, I'm not that kind of an expert in animal ethics. I'm very sure that that uh, people have worked on that. But I have to be honest, I do not know it. About decolonization, I'm happy to, is, that a, is there a possibility to post it somewhere? Because I have to be honest that I, I would not know it out of, out of the top of my head in a way that is, um, that is helpful to, to, to someone here. So would you that, can would that be it possible? You can post it in the event. Yeah, okay, then I'll, yeah, I'm sorry for, for postponing that again, but I'll try to think, think of something and then post it there. If I hope that's okay. And otherwise, if that person has uh, any, I, I don't see the question. Um, I think my email address should be on the website and then just feel free to, to, to ask me, should I not meet um, the interests you were actually looking for? Yes, I think, uh, I think your email address should be available. Yeah. So, so please feel free to email Bjorn anytime you want, yeah, hopefully. Sure. <laughs> Okay, I think we are up with time. There are still some questions left, but as I said, um, 
you, you feel free to email Bjorn. Uh, now, in 10 minutes, the discussion part will start. So uh, if you want to, you, can, you all can just move there. It will be very, very interesting. But anyways, thank you very much for attending today. And hopefully yeah, thank I you very much. Hopefully I can, I can see you or I will see you tomorrow.